Welcome to Sheffield DocFest. This is the DocFest Exchange. Um, this space has been developed in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust, a global charity that supports uh, improving health. And one of the things they're really excited about is to bring creative minds and thinkers together and to get that out there more widely. So what better place than to come to Sheffield DocFest where we have some fantastic films and interactive projects um, throughout the next five days. I have the great pleasure of introducing the filmmakers, Jules Gittos and Helen Rose of Snow Monkey. Now this session originally was going to include Sam Bass, uh, a child psychologist. He is stuck on the train heading up from London. He'll be here later, uh, hopefully you could meet him then. But I thought we should just have this fantastic session anyway because Snow Monkey is actually my personal favorite film of the entire festival. That's great. And it's been my honor that we could program and get you from Australia to come and talk to an audience about this film. I just wondered if you could introduce a bit about the film to an audience because people won't have seen it. I keep raving about it and telling people about this film, but if you could just say a few words to introduce it. Uh, well, I will, but I just want to say uh, Sheffield. I've never been to Sheffield and my grandmother uh, was born here uh, and her mother died at... <laughs> so there's... I got Sheffield blood. So while we're here, we're going to go and find uh, her... Her grave. She died giving birth to my, my grandmother, my gorgeous grandmother. And then she, my grandmother came to Australia. But, um, yeah, in life you don't know quite often what you're doing. But uh, throughout my life, I've, it seems that children in war have been part of it since for the last 40 years. I've covered many wars, you know, Rwanda, Somalia, Bosnia, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And... Usually with my films, it's about access. So in, in, uh, in, in Jalalabad, where we are, we've created an art centre called the Yellow House, which is the only place where people can learn to make films. Helen, my partner, uh, gives amazingly courageous women's workshops, teaching women to work in the media. And um, it's the only place where there can be theatre, film and, or, or art of any kind. And... I'm not the kind of person... I usually have to half-fund my own films because I find the films. Picasso used to say, I don't seek, I find. And uh, this film came about in a very funny way in that uh, at the Yellow House we've got... Um, we're making Pashto language dramas all the time. And uh, this... You know, Jalalabad just discovered ice cream. Um, it's a city where there are no fridges, there's no electricity... And so some entrepreneurs started getting kids to go around with little burrows selling ice creams. This amazing thing. People hadn't tasted ice cream before. But it was terrible for us because they've got horrible Chinese-made tunes going with the ice cream cart. So we'd be in the middle of uh, interviewing a Taliban leader or something and we'd hear... So I started going out and telling, um, trying to pay these boys not to come down our street. And then I realised that they were the film... And uh, it's one of those light bulb moments when we brought them into the Yellow House, and you'll see this in the film. It, it's not something that we've enacted for the film. It really happened like that. Uh, these kids, you know, their breakfast is just one of their own ice cream. So we got them, organised a lavish breakfast for them. And Helen and I have always had a problem. Although our films are targeted at women because we've got women actresses and it's showing girls going to school and women going to university and that of course is the huge problem of Afghanistan. It's very hard to get the, women, the films to the women because women are not allowed to go to video stores or music stores, they're not even allowed to go to a restaurant. And suddenly I had this flashbulb moment where I realised uh, the ice cream kids could sell our movies over the back fence and so we went into business together. and. Uh, so it's great. The mums can come down to the back to buy ice cream for their kids. Dad, who wouldn't want mum watching the movie, doesn't have to know and she can buy a movie over the back fence. And it's height of ice cream season at the moment. It's, it's uh, summer in Jalalabad, so uh, the boys are out there with <laughs> their carts and selling I the movie. I just want to say the ice creams are really yummy. Yeah, and uh, then really it's good. an interesting thing in that <laughs> to get an ice cream cart, these kids are 
are all extremely war damaged and in every case they're usually the only one in their family that's bringing in money. Quite often their father's either an invalid or being shot by the Americans or, or something has made the family dysfunctional. But to get like a little franchise of having the ice cream, ice cream cart for kids that are completely uneducated takes a lot of intelligence. And so we discovered that, you know, literally the cream of the most talented entrepreneurial kids in Jalalabad were selling ice cream and they were in collaboration with our Yellow House. And it uh, didn't take long before um, the boys said, look, if we're selling these movies, we want to be in them. And uh, they started making their own first movie. And um, they said, we're, we're the snow monkeys. That's where the title comes from, meaning they love to have fun. And they take monkeys with them on the little carts as a way of attracting other children to come and see the monkey and buy, buy an ice cream. And uh, that's how the film developed. Then we discovered that there were Ghostbusters who are even poorer kids who are Coochie kids. They're like the indigenous Aboriginal kids of Afghanistan. And they were friends with us, our snow monkeys and uh, they sell magic. They, they, they have smoke that gets rid of bad luck and curses and things. But because the Taliban had killed all the Sufis, the people who teach this kind of shamanism, the boys had no way of really lear learning their trade. And thank God one old Sufi had survived and we brought him to the Yellow House. So he started teaching the snow monkey boys magic, their own kind of magic. And then we discovered that the good kids, like the Ghostbuster boys and the snow monkey kids, were being preyed upon by gangster kids who were taking their money and beach, beating them up and torturing them and doing terrible things. And so we re recruited the gangster boys as well. And that's the main character in our film, is there's, there's a great moment in the film when the ice cream carts are stolen. <laughs> But you managed to turn that into a fantastic collaboration between two sets or gangs of kids to actually work together. Yeah, that is one of the great moments of the film in that um, I didn't want to just... The ice cream carts have been stolen by the gangster kids and there's this one kid, we don't, his name's Steele, we don't know if he's nine years old or 14 years old, he's tiny, but he's like the little Hitler of Jalalabad, everyone's terrified of him. And he w wasn't going to let the boys have their carts back I said, but you're going to be in a movie. And then they realised that the guy behind the camera is Amu Shah, who's the big action hero of all the local Pashto movies. And suddenly his face just lit up and he said, yeah, I want to be in movies, I want to be a star. And uh, so that's how we brought the gangster boys around. And then the film turns into a love story. We, we, every, you think that uh, this kid, Steele, who... Um, is absolutely brutal, he's kind of like a little psychopath, he has a razor blade, blade that he cuts people with and he threatens people with AIDS infected syringes. There was a monster but then we discovered he was in love. And some people who've seen the movie said this is the greatest love story since Bogart and Bacall. He's in love with this beautiful girl Shazia and Shazia knows that little Pool is a, a gangster and she wants him to go to school and, uh, and use his intelligence for something else. So it's a battle between his tendency to be bad and her desire to, you know, have him turn good. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the Yellow House and the kind of idea behind it. Well, um, as a war journalist and filmmaker, I've covered virtually every war since Vietnam. And I'm at a time I think most people in the world have lost faith in politicians altogether. Like I was in Iraq and I knew that to, you know, invade Iraq would bring the disaster that it has. You know, things were quite fine under Saddam Hussein. And um, always I felt, you know, the worst, my worst experience was being in Rwanda. I was there when thousands of people were slaughtered by machete. And I've always brought my, what I've discovered back in the form of films and painting and art and talked about it, but it's had no impact at all uh, to bring about change in the countries where I work. So. In my old age, I've decided the only thing I can do is to actually put all my, most of my time and energy into actually changing the place like Afghanistan through art. And um, as, as an Australian, um, it cost, I looked into it, it cost a million dollars a year to have uh, just one soldier in Afghanistan. Every soldier cost our government a million dollars a year. 
And yet we've created a place in Jalalabad which has just run from the... We haven't got funding from anywhere except for the sale of the art that, and the films that we produce at the Yellow House. And uh, we're still there, but the Australian government have withdrawn their soldiers, the place has gone back to the way it was, and um, nothing was achieved, but a lot of people were killed, a lot of destruction was done. And, um, yeah. And Helen, I wanted to come to you to talk a little bit about the, your background as a teacher. And, and how that works its way into this approach that you... Yeah, you well, across. I think every teacher, every teacher of arts knows the value of art in the classroom for freeing up uh, children and, and anyone who's inhibited. I'm a, a drama teacher in Australia and I always know there's that quiet child at the back of the room that's suddenly up the front and leaping and bounding off the walls. Um, the great thing with the women in Afghanistan is that um, they have a, an opportunity to do something they've never been allowed to do um, and the society is so mannered um, that, that they end up having a lot of fun. Um, when what we decided we were going to do was we had this challenge that of course they couldn't be seen on screen and wouldn't show their faces on film. Some of the women are quite happy to have their photo faces photographed uh, but I'm always very careful about ever showing those, even in Australia or in any other European country, just in case what can happen is a relative could see them and, and there can be repercussions, ha horrific repercussions. Um, so, we, you know, we realised that the, the word niqab actually means mask. And so being an, an acting teacher, and this is England, um, <laughs> you all know what masks are. So... Wearing a mask is an incredibly freeing experience for, for any person. And so for these women, it was just, it was a real joy. Um, on the way there, uh, we stopped off in Norway and went into a, one of those great mask places. And George and I were running around and I said, oh, well, I'll get the pretty ones for the women. And I got little things with diamantes and butterfly wings. And, and George said, I'm getting the horror ones for the boys and got all those gnarly ones that you see in the film. And uh, we had all the masks laid out when the women were there and they actually ran straight to the horror masks and um, put them on and were laughing and shrieking. And it just, it's, it's a form of catharsis. And uh, just to have that moment, uh, it, well, those hours at the Yellow House, especially in the beginning, uh, really consolidated the women, uh, which we know in our own society and, and the struggle that we've had in, with feminism, uh, the sort of like competing for you know, competing against each other without, uh, you know, joining um, in, in solidarity uh, is a dangerous thing. It can undermine everyone. So it sort of really brought the whole team together. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're now working on making a fantasy slash horror short films. Um, and you would think that in a place where they're surrounded by such dreadful carnage that they would go to something else. But I think that that actually helps them to make sense of the world around them, somehow. So if, if Sam Wass was here today, he might be able to explain more, but um, yeah. So, so, so picking up on some of the questions about, so Sam Vass, the psychologist on the train, sends his apologies, as does RRT Prasad, her, um, who's at University College London. They had a couple of questions for you, actually, about the film, which I, we managed to, to get as they were trying to travel and, and get here. Um, one of the questions was, um, what it was that you were trying to get at. So this is from Sam. In thinking about how, what, what you were hoping to achieve by getting the kids to watch themselves on the screen. So the act of them, kind of, they've made the film. And there's a brilliant moment in the film where they've, they've watched themselves on a poster, but they also watch the movie. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that when we first, we've watched, the, the great thing about what we've achieved by doing uh, an art place in, like, Jalalabad is where Bin Laden was. It's the worst place in Afghanistan in terms of the war and everything else. Is that when we first got there, billboards were completely blank and you couldn't have a human figure in a photograph in the city. But uh, as we've worked, now you, we can have billboards uh, explaining how women um, don't have to marry someone they don't love and how they can leave a bad relationship. And this with actually pictures of women and so on. on, on. So there's been all that progress. And uh, for these kids that are, were going out, um, you know, they wrote their own script based on their life. And I think that was... Like, for example, there's a scene where Zabi explains in the film that he was stabbed by 
thieves, you know, just for the money he'd made with his ice cream. And uh, then they wrote their own lives into the script. And I've been doing this for years and years and years, which is taking real stories and converting them into, into film. And uh, in Jalalabad, the Taliban put up the first electronic billboard, you know, like in Times Square, just to advertise mosque times to make sure that everyone got to mosque on time. And I went down and found out that we could act I could actually rent this thing. So the uh, Ice Cream Boys made a music video, which is a very taboo thing to do. Music, children, video, all of that. And uh, we put it on one night and suddenly we had all the worst of the nasties all standing around us telling us that they're going to cut our heads off and this and that for putting a music video on the main street. And I confronted them and I said, look, uh, these are all local kids. We're getting them to school. They've created this. Uh, this is helping the city. And uh, the musician is someone you probably had at your own children's wedding. And by explaining that it wasn't like cultural imperialism, it was completely homegrown, homeborn, we turned them around. We turned the worst of the Taliban around. And so now when we put something up, they'll be the first to defend it. And these are guys which the Americans and every, uh, English, British, and that have been fighting and killing. And if you put a gun to their ha head and said, you've got to screen a music video, they'd rather say, pull the trigger. But by doing it the way that we've done, um, we've succeeded I with think, it. I think from a teacher's point of view, a ch child, you know, children, when they see that, it's an elevation. It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a raising of self-esteem. Yeah, it is. And it's a national pride thing as well because the song is written by a local musician. It's sung in Pashto. And I think now that in a country that is so downtrodden, um, everyone's self-esteem, it's no, virtually non, non-existent. Oh, yeah, and yeah. so it was a triumph, um, you know, seeing oneself high on the screen, just as we would um, and get that I same I was wondering feeling. about... So Sam was wondering about the, um, the Steel character... Uh, well, who's particularly yeah. violent in the film and he's kind of cutting people's faces. And well, when, when I first met Steel, um, in the, like we don't even know if Steel's got parents and he's got a lot of dependents. All of the kids in our film have, have got families that are dependent on them, younger, younger brothers and sisters, and Steel's gone the way of violence. And I think... If, you know, a, psych a child psychologist looked at Steele, he'd say well, this and child... And mothers is too, because mothers can't work. A ch a ch this work. child um, is a genuine psychopath. But I just saw him as a genius. I just thought a kid this, this age, who is smaller than everyone else, it could control a whole city, he'd worked out ways that um, even the police were frightened of him. Because you could imagine a gang of small boys with AIDS-infected needles and razor blades... You might have a gun or you might be a big, tough man, but you're not, they're like little piranhas. They're going to take you apart. And so he figured it all out. And he had a... He was like a politician. You know, I'd buy uh, him and his, his gang a meal, but he'd make sure everyone ate before he did, even though they're all scared of him, and then he'd take away what was left for the gang members that weren't there. So it was sort of like a, a give and control thing. Okay. But um, then... Uh, I realised that, um, well, it was funny with me. I've come from a similar kind of background. My grandfather was a gangster and I saw people killed and so on. So um, Steele said to me, oh, you know, you're a fighter, were you? And I said, yeah, I was a fighter. So he took my fists and it'd be like a steel worker in, in um, Sheffield looking at the hand of someone to find out whether he really had worked manually in his life. And my knuckles have all been spread from hitting buckets of sand and punching bags and suddenly I had integrity to steal because he realised I wasn't uh, lying, that I'd had this similar background. So actually having grown up with organised crime myself, I was understand, able, under, able to understand his psychology and the feeling is that Steele will end up probably collaborating with us at the Yellow House, he'll probably end up making films and being a kind of creative boss, like which is what a director or a producer is. And we'll have saved the city a, a, a really serious psychopath. And so I'm, I'm kind of embodying the two speakers that, that aren't here. Yeah. Uh, so Arati Prasad, who's based at um, Uni University of uh, College London, one of the things she wondered about was about the, the kids. The kids talk about education and how they're not able to get into it and that they sit outside of being able to, to get into school. The approach that you're taking and using the arts 
what have you got to say for, for that in terms of well, their well, education? Well, any teacher would understand the problem in a country which has had continuous war, uh, the schools have only just started to open. So for the teachers, uh, they can take on young kids to teach them literacy and mainly it's middle-class-ish middle class kind of parents that are getting the kids to school even though they're not paying for the education. And all the other kids, like over there, a, a parent has... 10 to 15 children with the idea that the kids will look after them in their retirement. Their retirement can be as early as 40 and the parents have got no sympathy for them going to school. But the problem is for our kids, the very bright ones that were working at the Yellow House had shown all this talent, the schools wouldn't accept them because uh, they would be too disruptive going in there not knowing how to read or write. So we set up classes at the Yellow House where we got tough teachers from the school to come down and teach our kids basic literacy. And then recently when I was back there, I, I've always been frightened of headmasters. I got expelled from school myself. And the headmaster called me around. He's a very intimidating man running a, a school in, in Jalalabad. And I thought, oh, you know, the kids have been up to something. And I was delighted. They'd all been jumped up a couple of levels. They'd actually done, excelled so well at school that they'd been moved up. And so we're, we're just very proud of them. You found a way back in for them, which is fantastic. One yeah. of the things that we need to do is open it up for the audience and to see if there's uh, any questions that people would like to ask well, of, well, the, like, of the film. Actually, just before we do that, you know, the, the esteem thing is very interesting. Little, one of our most talented kids who uh, Helen was recognised as a genuine actor's name's Irfan. Yeah. And he lived just down the road from a martial arts school run by... Pakistani trained officers and only rich parents could sell, send their kids there and he would just stand and look through the window and watch these other kids and he just so much wanted to learn martial arts and it was his dream and uh, I took him down and the instructor said look I'd love to teach this kid I know some of these other kids are just doing it because their parents are forced but we know that he really wants to do it but this is a franchise I can't I, I said okay well I'll pay for him to have Tuition. Now, he, his, his clothes were covered in holes, he was dirty, and all these middle-class kids were looking at him like, we don't want that smelly little rat in our, um, in our class. And then I realised I had a major asset standing next to me, which was Amish Shah, the most famous movie actor in uh, Jalalabad. And so I just announced to all these uppity kids, well, you know, Irfan's going to be in our movie, he's going to be a star, and he's working with Amish Shah. And I said, by the way, Amish Shah, can you just go and show these kids how to do a few kicks. Well, Amir Shah's got a couple of black belts and he did the most amazing demonstration. And so suddenly every kid, every one of these kids that were, were snobbing uh, Irfan suddenly wanted to be his best friend because here's a kid on a road to become a movie star. So I actually find um, you film... Do, you do that in the moment. You just kind of Yeah, come we up do it in the moment. That. And that, these things, it's all improvised, George's, you know, George's it's like jazz. Life is improvised, yeah. yeah so <laughs> I'm in a great it's way. A, it's an epic movie. I think it breaks the ground of how documentaries can be made. You have so many characters. There are so many stories. Yeah. Things, ex the, some of the explosions that happen uh, as in the middle of being filmed, the kind of, you're, you're capturing stuff really as it's happening. Um, I really, these sh sessions unfortunately are short because we want to get conversations going as you're going to be around for a little bit to, to, to chat more. But yeah. we really wanted to see if there are any questions uh, in the audience for Helen and George. And, and if you can wait for the We've microphone to come to We've got one up the back you. here. We've got a question. If you can wait for the microphone, thanks. Hi, I'm really sorry. I just turned up and, you, and this seems like a really interesting thing. I haven't seen it. But... Um, uh, just to do with your subjects, how close do you feel that you got to your subjects in the movie and does that show through inside the movie and do you think it was a barrier to producing the kind of tale that you wanted to do? Does that make any sense? Yeah, well, it's, it's, we've been operating at the Yellow House now for about six or seven years, you know, in Jalalabad, so we're part of the community. I'm Baba George, so I can, we can, I can be lying in the street with a camera getting a low shot and no one's going to be able to ta take any notice of me. And, you know, I've got the long hair because I'm, um, I'm seen as a Shinwari, which have long hair. Shinwari means blue eyes. And uh, people also sort of see me as a Sufi. And uh, so if there's a... Um, the police are giving out awards, they get me to come along and help hand out the medals and things. So we're that much... We're, we're so much part of the community that these things are possible. Plus, we've got the respect... 
we had a um, we've had a Helen when she was doing her women's workshops. We had a our embassy told us that they had information from the CIA that we were going to be killed and kidnapped and we'd have to leave. And Helen said, "No, I'm not leaving. I was actually out of the country for that moment." And then we Helen went and saw um, the local Malik and the local. Uh, Muller, and we discovered that someone had said that we were running a Christian missionary place. So we brought everyone along, showed them what we were doing, and we got rid of the idea and, you know, that rid of the death threat and everything moved on. But um, it's been very, very sensitive to the community and their needs and um, constantly being out there and being known to them. Um, and, of course, uh, with kids, it's a matter of bringing their families and their parents in and, you know, everyone feels included. Um, George, there was another question, actually, from Arati. Oh, no, he's, go he's still going, isn't he? Oh, he's no, coming. I, also, um, kind of, I probably didn't say it very clearly, but it's the line, uh, the uh, objectivity kind of uh, line and argument that um, I really wanted to ask about. Kind of, uh, did you intend to make documentary to be, to involve yourself in the lives of your subjects in the documentary, or did you want to kind of leave well, like an the objective line? My, with, my, my films... Um, break barriers and I don't believe in this uh, thing where uh, the purest form of documentary would just be to run security cameras you know like there's no presence there there's just spies in the sky you know watching people um, I intervene I'm a performer and so is Helen and um, we, uh, we just cannot understand we did a we did a talk like this at Columbia University and they've all been trained there's some Eskimo movie they watched where no one wanted to stand around in the cold all day, so someone put a fish on the hook, and that was seen as a terrible thing to do. The Eskimo should have caught the fish, and the cameraman should have been there for 12 hours until he did. I think that's nonsense. And But I, there's something I do object to, which is the uh, big game hunter ma mentality of making films. I know that in a lot of wealthy countries, like particularly uh, in Europe uh, and America, uh, there are foundations, and someone will say, I want to go and make a film about abused women in Kabul. So this person's never been to Kabul before. They go with a team of cameras and they know that they, if they go to a refuge or a hostel where there's really sincere social workers who've worked with the women for years, they'll suddenly get access to a whole lot of stories. They bag this film in a couple of weeks, take it back and suddenly they're a hero of Afghanistan and uh, they really don't understand or feel the culture. But of course, what they've done is so politically correct and... Um, I, I, I'd like to say something off. here as yeah. well. When we're actually... George is an artist first, and he's a very famous one in Australia, and I'm a singer. So we don't actually go there like a, the usual documentary makers. I went there and, and hung out with the musicians, and, you know, I now sing a whole, like, set of songs in Pashto, and we wrote the soundtrack to the film, and... Um, and George goes there and, and paints or, you know, meets with the Sufis. And, and that's, that's how the stories... That's how we discover the stories, in a way. So we, we, have a, we, we start on a different premise than most documentary makers, in that sense. Yeah, so. for, for us, the end product film that comes to be shown to you at uh, the Sheffield Film Festival is far less important than the films that we make in Pashto language that go out to Afghans and uh, much less important than the actual what we're doing there. As I said early in this talk, I've had a lifetime of covering wars and being in Rwanda and Iraq and other places. And I've come back and I've shown films in festivals like this most of my life and I've seen it make no difference at all. But being on the ground and doing something... So we're more like the people running the women's refuge where the filmmaker comes from the rich country yes. and That's uses it. their resources <laughs> to make a movie and it looks terrific. We're actually and then on we the get the women to turn the cameras on them. <laughs> with the real people. And um, I've got no time for people who say, well, you're not objective, you're not, you know, you're not detached mm. enough and this sort of thing. Mm. I say, to hell with that approach to filmmaking. We're here to make a difference. And, and this change in the narrative from one character to the other, you can really see that. So, so the, the, the story switches and flips. And it's an incredible film to watch. I'd really advise that people go see it. And it's it. got a great soundtrack. It's amazing. Afghan music with um, some fantastic, famous Melbourne musicians like Mick Harvey, Hugo Race, myself, Brian Hooper, Kim Salmon, along with Zalalai Pakhtar, the Luckman players. It's, it's an extraordinary collaboration 
There's no sort of ethnocentric otherness about it. We're right in there and we're all having a great time. But I always have problems at film festivals. Like I, 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 sometimes I've judged them and I felt like I was seeing all the misery of the world in one place in, in two weeks or something, you know. And, and um, I like to put a lot of humour into my films. I'm a showman. I like them to be entertaining. And um, I find it really hard to watch over-serious documentaries, you know. It's, it's a matter of reaching people. But also, uh, as an artist, I'm aware that uh, documentary film is an evolving medium. Like, when I was a lot younger, I made classic for the BBC, BBC documentaries with a standard narrator and following all the rules. And now, you know, the world is in such a mess, we need to kind of have an element of shock treatment, which is what Picasso did when he went from absolute realism to putting the nose on the wrong side of the face. I think we've got, the documentary makers got to realise that uh, this is a, mo a medium which is evolving, just like painting and music and everything else evolves, and that the kind of the BBC formula of how a good documentary is made is uh, not necessarily the way to reach people. On that note, I think we'll have to wrap up and close. I want to thank our filmmakers, Helen and George, not just filmmakers, but artists who are transforming uh, these young people's lives. Um, Snow Monkey is screening on Wednesday at the ITN Source showroom for at 12.30, so I did urge you to use your delegate tickets to go, uh, passes to go and get a ticket. It really is an, an epic, it's an epic movie, it really is. And um, to, to invite you to come back uh, again here, we're having talks every single day throughout the festival. Our next one is Strike a Pose. We're having an in conversation tonight with the filmmakers. Um, this 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 Docfest Exchange Forum can be your home from home. It's it's a hub where you can hang out, chat, and meet people. Helen and George are going to hang around for a little bit. So come in. I just in wanted to say there to is say two screenings of the film. Oh. Two. Oh, Sunday. Fantastic. Sunday's yeah, yeah, yeah. two, Thanks, two chances to see the movie. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Susan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you're going to hang around and have a chance yeah. to chat to we're, people. We're here for the duration and, yeah. um, and loving every minute of it. Yeah. So. And, and we should say, you know, you come all the way from the other side of the world we to be have. here. And I'm what so a excited. journey. That was thank an you, epic thank journey. Thank you so much. Um, so, yes, um, let's, let's keep the conversation going. See you later for Striker Pose at 4.30. And there's thank another little thing, seeing that poster over there with the virtual reality... Uh, we, for in future, we will be making a virtual reality mil mil documentary simultaneously with every other documentary we make. We believe that uh, virtual reality is actually enabling people to have a much greater sense of um, involvement. I watched that amazing thing, Waves of Grace, you know, about Iberia. It's incredible. And uh, you feel that you're really looking into people's eyes. And I think that's in a lot of ways where documentary is going. And that's what by being as close to our subject as we are in, in Snow Monkey, in a way, it is kind of like virtual reality. We're taking you into the city. Sometimes when I'd be lying in the dirt and the filth of the Jalalabad st street with uh, dead animal blood and all this sort of thing around trying to get a shot of a little girl collecting cans, it was almost like being underwater on the barrier reef and having all this amazing stuff move past. There's a... An element now of, um, I think, like it's in theatre, immersive theatre. We're mo moving towards a period in documentary which is more and more immersive and um, taking you into the people and the plays. Fantastic. Cheers. Put your hands together for George and Helen. Thank you. Thank you.